All right. Um, state of mind, Sunday. Oh, if you like what you see, subscribe, hit the little click, click. Because if I don't say it now, I forget. So I'll say it now. Uh, who do I have here? His name is Ronnie Marmo. Ronnie Marmo is, is, um, is a friend of mine. I haven't seen him in a long time. Ronnie was on General Hospital playing Ronnie. Ronnie Domestico or what? Is that it? <laughs> yeah, Domestico. I can't believe you remember that. Ronnie Domestico. I goose it when he wrote the part. He goes, how about the name Ronnie? I go, okay. <laughs> Ronnie Domestico. I guess if that's, you know. Uh, Ronnie, everybody loved him. There's no because he he was he's like just a good guy, but he's a very funny guy. But I, I think that with Ronnie, he was how could I say this? He was underrated because of his personality. And underneath, he was a great actor. But because he was always fine and that, we didn't see it that way. And then he he did a play called Lenny Bruce. And he showed everybody what it's all about. And I just I just did some research on him and all these great actors are saying that's the greatest performance, this, this, and that. So that's who Ronnie is. Um, I also, but I want to talk more about this in depth. I also saw him kick James Franco's ass. And we'll get into that in, in a second. Oh, man. How you doing, bro? I'm good. I'm good. Let me drink some uh, water. Salud. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for being here. So you you grew up in Brooklyn. Started there. And you look like you grew up in Brooklyn. Well, so do you, by I the know, way. but I did. It's like looking in a mirror. Are you kidding me? I know. No, I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn and then moved to Jersey when I was six. Yeah. But I, no one sounded like me in Jersey. I was doing, first day of kindergarten, I had a, a pro kid, well, con, same sneakers I'm wearing now, actually, probably oh, the same. Con, those Converse? Yeah, yeah. I was wearing Converse. I had thick jeans with the knee pads, a white t-shirt, a brown leather jacket, and a comb in my back pocket. And I walk into kindergarten, all the other kids in New Jersey were like, oh my God, look at him, like something out of a movie. I was like, see you later, ma. And all the kids are like, you know. Wow. Holding on to their parents' legs. And I'm like, I'll see you later. You know? So in Jersey, nobody sounded like me. And then ultimately. Uh, but now you you sound like we sound like alike. We don't sound like you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm trying to make a living in show business. I can't walk around like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to do other things, which I'm very lucky. I do get to do other things. But I can ham that up when I need to. Yeah. You know. So you grew, so you grew up um, and your mom and dad, how were you as a kid? Out of control. I was born. Everybody's I, out of control. I was. Uh, I was born an identical twin. Not many people know that. Wait a minute. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah. When we when I was born, I had a brother named Frankie, and uh, I was about two pounds, and he was like six pounds. And when we were born, and my mother back back then in the seventies, they took photos like you know of the babies it wasn't like now with the ultrasound so i was always hiding behind my brother so they would she would say to him i have two babies in me and they'd go no you don't one baby and she'd go listen i know my body i have two babies well when it was time for delivery she was right they weren't prepared and my brother died and uh and it's interesting because i've always a lot of people don't know that about me but i've always kind of i feel i feel him i think about him she said, yeah, that was going to ask. Yeah, you. yeah, it's true. When I was like four, four years old, my mother says she used to come in the bathroom in the middle of the night and I'd be in the mirror going, Frankie, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Like instinctually, because I didn't know. Yeah, I was just learning how to speak English and I would talk to, I was speaking English. I was learning how to speak at all. And I would talk in the mirror, you know, Frankie. Yeah. So you felt that there was something yeah. that, that, yeah. that was missing a million percent yeah. and that you, you felt kind of bad for yeah subconscious like i didn't know i was doing it but like yeah i always felt this like longing and i felt bad like i'm the one that kind of got to you know stick it out and he didn't and so it wasn't talked about a lot in my family there was not a lot of discussion until my mother's last day on earth she said frankie's been calling me all day that's what she said to me are you serious yeah, yeah. So, oh man you're gonna make me cry it's a whole thing so my mom talks to me because my dad my dad was an identical twin Mm. And they were so alike that even as a boy, I couldn't tell them apart. 
I wonder what it would have been like. I wonder what it would have been like for my life to have an identical twin. I think it's a. It would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. And the the closeness supposedly is outrageous. Yeah, yeah. And I've always felt it, but I had no one to share that with. How yeah. about when you got older? Did you still feel anything? Or well, I don't know. You know, I wasn't in tune so much with my. Uh, you know, I was running around filling that and other voids with basically anything I could get my hands on. So. In terms of like, did I feel it? Probably. I couldn't name it or yeah. label it. Yeah. But it, later on in life, you know, after lots of good therapy, lots of recovery, being an artist, I was able to tap in and go, oh, maybe that's what that is, that thing I feel, you know. So when you were, yeah. it was Jersey now, right? Jersey now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, were you like a bad kid, like getting in trouble a lot? and All the time. And you were drinking a lot. Well, at first, I, I would say up till about age 11, I was, a, I mean, I was a pain in the ass. You but know what do you I mean, mean, Ronnie? I was pain a pain in the ass. I was like, you know, I thought my name, can I curse on this? Fuck yeah. I didn't, I thought my name was Little Fuck till I was about 13 years <laughs> old. Where's the Little Fuck? Where is he? Where is he? Little Fuck and Little Bastard. Those were my two names. Where's the Little Bastard? I used the Little Fucks out there. Get your hands off the walls. What is he doing? Leave her alone. Stop it. All day long, they broke my chops, you know? So, so I was just like. I mean, today, maybe, and I don't mean to make light of this, maybe I would have been treated, maybe ADD. I don't know. I yeah. was just all over you the place. You seem like ADD. I was all over the place, you know? And, and there's so, nothing wrong with that. No, of course. Listen, listen I'm glad they have a, a label for lots of things. Uh, absolutely. When we were kids, we were just running around like, yeah. cut it out, sit down, shut up. You know, yeah. it was like, no. Nah, yeah, not, because, you know, yeah. I didn't know, as far as mental health, I didn't know as a kid, I didn't know what bipolar, manic depression, yeah. mental ill. I did the only thing that I knew. It's interesting, and then I ended up being in a mental institution. The only thing I knew is that crazy people end up in mental institutions. That's something that you, your parents talked about when you were little, right? Well, yeah, it was a stigma. There's a stigma yeah. about mental health, just like in the '30s, there was a stigma if you were an alcoholic. Yeah. They would strap you down to a bed and throw right. you away, like in a hospital. They didn't right. want to deal with that. Oh, he's an alcoholic, you know. And then, you know, finally, we made some progress with that. And then suddenly mental health is, you know, along those lines, meaning, which alcoholism is a form of mental health too. But, but I mean, you know, they started to address it and not disrespect it. In fact, try to embrace it, uh, which is what you've done, which is Thank beautiful. You. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the COVID has really done the best for, I, I keep saying it, I'll say it again, for mental health because it it has forced people to not run when they're mm. feeling a certain way. Mm. We were stuck in the house. Yeah, and I have right. many stories of that that weren't pretty because mm. I didn't want my kids to to see me in that light and that I couldn't, I had to eat with them, you know? You didn't, have, couldn't. you didn't have the work and the thing to take you away for no. a certain amount of hours of right, the day right. where you could hide all that yes. stuff. I know that very well. Yeah, so they had to see. So as a teenager, the, I wanted to get to the drink. So when I was 11, my father left. And I was on, you know, he was my, he was the guy who was nine feet tall to me. You know what I mean? He was of course. My and so my mother was this little Italian housewife who went from that to working 85 hours a week in three jobs because she... My mother was so proud that she was like, we're not going to take a dime for any, from anybody, not the government, nobody. We're going to, so she went from in the morning, she woke up and she drove a school bus for kids who went to this one school that it was the last school before they just throw you away. And they loved her. She always, you know, so talk about mental health. These kids were all out of control, but, but Rosie, they loved Rosie, my mother. So she had them all on a, on a string, you know, uh, whatever she, so she would drive the school bus all day. Then she would run at five o'clock and sell vinyl siding over the telephone. Gee. And then at, at nine o'clock, she'd go to the diner and work till 2 a.m. And then wake up at five. You were the only son? No, I have an older brother. Oh. So, but what happened was, is I went from ultra supervision to none overnight. So my father left, my mother. Why'd was, your father leave? I mean, you know, there's lots of different reasons. Yeah. It, it, he told, you know, I had a million th thoughts on why he left. But my mother's funeral, my mother died at 53. She was a young woman, which is crazy to think, right? I was 24. But it was at her funeral, you want to hear a crazy story? He walks in and nobody's seen him in years. And he didn't feel well, he had a cane, he wasn't doing, he had cirrhosis of the liver and hep C. My father went through a lot. He died as well. But he walked in 
And he starts talking, open casket. He starts talking to her. Rosie, Rosie, I got to talk to you. No. That loud and everybody got quiet. Because before that, everybody's laughing. It's my mother's funeral and everybody loved my mother. Like, ah, you know, big laugh. All of a sudden he walks in, you can hear a pin drop. Rosie, Rosie, I want to tell you why I left. I've been wanting to tell you why I left. And he's talking to my mother who's dead in the casket. And I look at my brother, and I didn't mean to be funny, but you know me instinctually. Yeah. I tend to say something stupid. I go, he's like, Rosie, it was too much. You were too much for me. It was too much. You were too much of a woman for me. It was, you were too, it was, it was too much. You know what I mean? Like, too, like he wanted to run around and do whatever he was doing. Of course. So, so I turn to my brother. He's saying all this, and, and I go, and everybody's crying, you know. And I go, hey, Jimmy. I guess mommy and daddy aren't getting back together. <laughs> Cause you know, as a kid, Mo, you always think like you always think like maybe they're gonna meet in a bus someday right, and right. they're gonna see each other from across the Now in that moment, did you want to be fun? No, oh no. No. You were honest. Yeah, I looked but at it's my, still funny. I looked at my mother, I looked at my dad, and my mother, and I go, and I guess I said it loud, I didn't even know I go, I guess mommy and daddy aren't getting back together. Because you always think maybe, I understand. Maybe, just yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. someday. But knowing Ronnie, you know, me. I thought it would. You know, he's going to put a little humor well, that, in there. <laughs> yeah, but not. A, but you know what I've come to learn about myself is that the humor is a release for me. I know, dude. I you know. understand yes. what it is. Yeah. And those who know me best, when they see me being goofy, they go, "What's what's wrong? What's going on?" Right. You know. Right. My friends understand that. You know. I mean, sometimes I'm just funny. Ask my fiance. I'm a freaking barrel. Well, that's what I was gonna say. Now your fiance is gonna ground you in that area. Yeah. Well, she's gonna. Okay. She's crazier than I am. Oh, okay. Well. She's also full blooded Italian. You know. <laughs> you know. You know what our house looks like. <laughs> I love you. You know, it's like that. Right. Love, yeah. Love and hate look exactly the same <laughs> in my house. You know, just so you know. Um. Anyway, so that's what happened. Yeah. When my dad left. What happened was, I was about you know 11, 12 years old, and the 16 year olds in my neighborhood became my heroes because my mother was working you know three uh, jobs 85 hours a week i went from all the supervision to none and suddenly i'm going hanging out with these 16 year olds and i'm 12 and they go ronnie go steal that pack of cigarettes for us no if you do we'll give you a little toke and so i'd go oh okay and then i took all the info from the 16 year olds i went back to the 12 year olds and they're like how do you know all that? You're brilliant. You know, so you're the leader. So I became the leader of the 12 year old. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I had the info. Yeah. Wow. And so, uh, and that's what happened. And my mother, and believe me, my mother was, she was the greatest person I ever knew. You know, it's, so this is not to disrespect her. But what I learned over the last few years, because I went through some hardcore therapy and been working on myself pretty, a lot. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, what I learned was, one day, my 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 uh, my uh, therapist says to me, "Your mother abandoned you," and I went, "How could you do?" I went, "My, yeah, my, my mother, she was the she was a proud woman. She was incredible." She goes, "Yeah, but she worked all those jobs to teach you one lesson. But what happened is she it took her out of the house, so she was teaching you something, but she but you needed her." So yeah. maybe she should have got a little assistance from the government and stayed home and raised you. And I went, whoa. Well, I didn't look at it that way. My mother didn't know any better. I mean, That's the thing was, about the parents. They don't know. They teach you a lesson that yeah. they think is important, but they're, they have blinders on to the other stuff. Right. Today, luckily, we have enough where we can look and see how else we can be you know, good parents. And, <sighs> and she, uh, it blew my mind that I was really mad at her. I was like, how can you talk about my mother like that? Yeah, yeah. Nobody was more loyal. Right, man. right. She was right. But sometimes loyal will kill you. This is what happened. Kill you, so, right? so of course I forgive her. I mean, she did, she literally did the best she could. But, you know. So while you were in those teenage years, I yeah. know you were drinking. Oh, yeah. And how much were you drinking? Because we're going to get into Tyler Christopher too. Well, okay, but but let's my let's maybe Tyler. we start now. I don't give. Well, you know, you know, my I, I I've started like the guys would give me a little hit off a joint, this and that, this and that. I would say by the time I was fourteen, I I dropped out of school in eighth grade. No, yeah, no, not many people know that. I I didn't go to high school. I signed up for Perth Amboy Votech, a vocational. I thought maybe I should be a plumber or something, and I went one day. And then I never went back. And and let's just say, uh, how do I say this politely? Let's just say next, you know, I was dealing in pharmaceuticals. I was wow. I was fourteen years old. I I I, uh, 
I had a Corvette that I used to park around the street that my mother, my, I was 14, I had a beautiful Corvette. I wasn't even old enough to drive. And you don't have a driver's license. I was 14 years old, I a driver's license. license. And, I, and I was making a couple thousand a day. And I was running like- I So had, you were Sonny, I young was, Sonny. I was young Sonny. Wow. I got a funny story to tell you about. That's that. amazing. You ready, you ready yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This, look, state of mind goes here, there. Kind of like our mind. Yeah, I think it's going to go like this, and it, it just doesn't. But I'm going to rename the show to Ronnie and Maurice's mind because it's here, <laughs> there, there. It's crazy. When I was uh, when I was a kid, people used to say to me all the time, you look like that guy Maurice Bernard. You no. Could, all the time. You, look, you could play his brother. You should be his brother. So you ready for this? I, I meet Vanessa Marcel. Yes. We're good friends. My friend. Yeah, mine too. She brought me to L.A. But, I mean, she's like a sister. Like, we spent like 12 Christmases in a row together. So at the height of you and her and the Brenda Sunny stuff. I made I, her, you know. You made her? I, your humility is just so attractive to me, Mo. Uh, son of a bitch, listen to me. By the way, <laughs> you're the only other Mo I know. You don't know my nickname's Ronnie Mo my whole life. Yeah, but but listen. But I defer to you when you, when people call you Mo. When I went to GH, I didn't even put it on the table. But Ronnie, I'm a Mo though. Yes, you're more of a Mo, because I was never called Mo. So when why I was did this happen? Because Michael Knight, who's an actor on a soap opera that I well, I did all my children with, he would call me Mo, but nobody called me Mo, and I didn't even like it to be honest with you. I was Ronnie Mo growing up, and then when I got see, a, you're Mo Mo, more Mo. A Momo? Yeah. Your Momo. They called me that too. A lot of shit. Believe me. Momo. Um, anyway, so they said that about you. So I'm not even an actor yet. I know Vanessa very well. Tyler, I know we're about to get into, who's one of my best friends. But I always looked up to you and Vanessa because I wanted to do that. But I didn't, I was in Jersey. I'm running the streets of Jersey. I didn't even know I could. Wow. And so and so you and Vanessa were at the pinnacle yeah. of where I wanted I just understood that you were making a living in show. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in Jersey working at the macaroni grill, friggin' selling the whatever the hell macaroni. Right, right. And, and going, I could do that, man. I could do that. You know, so I want you to know that. It was really So what it was cool. How did you get to the acting then? We'll get to Tyler later, but how did you get to the acting? from people saying you could be Maurice Bernard's brother and you, how'd that happen? So I'm, I'm a teenager and I'm running the streets. Uh, you know, I ended up smoking crack. I was a hardcore, no, I was a hard. What is crack like? It's free base, but I was making my own. There was a time in my life when I, I actually got, my house got raided, I got busted and I was, a, I was a, just a kid. And, I, and what I was doing is you take, well, I was, it was a little crazy. I was taking ammonia and I was cooking cocaine and making crack making rocks and just smoking a day and night locking myself in my bedroom and my mother was working so you know nobody had an eye on me and i was just out of control what is the feeling of when you first take a hit off crack you only get that feeling once then what the f you never get it back but you chase it the whole oh, time oh come on really do you get it back at 20 percent uh you get high but it's never the first one it's and never, what is that first one like? It's it's unexplainable. It's it's familiar. that that's you know, why everybody loses it, and then you can't get it back, and then you're done. You're, you're addicted. Done. Yeah, and what I was a, running the streets as a teenager with no supervision, and uh, I went from like supplying nine towns with all kinds of shit. I was selling this, that, and the other thing. To if I would sell somebody a little taste, three in the morning, I was throwing rocks at their pebbles at their window, going, "Can I get that back?" Wow. I know it was only $25. Can I have it back? I became my best customer. And it got really out of hand. I tell you that just to tell you that, like, so I'd be on the street corner with these guys and we'd be doing just crazy stuff. But then I would go home and I would write poetry. Ooh. But I didn't know what that was. I just knew that I, I was an artist, but I didn't know. I didn't know how to label it or what to call it. Because all my friends on the street were just lugheads. And I always had some, I always had one eye on something else but I didn't know where it like was. Like what kind of poetry, man? Beat poetry. I still have the poems. I just wrote beat poetry and I would write uh, just about how I was feeling, what I was thinking. And nobody in my neighborhood did that. So what I'm saying was it was so instinctual. And so I was an artist, I didn't know it. I didn't know what no, to No, you were a it. poet and you didn't know it. 
Hey, I like that. You should, you should, uh, what I is know. that coin? Thank that? you, thank you. You're very talented. Thank you, thank you. All right, so, so, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so I would do that, right? Right. And so, and I'm talking like, it got really dark, like Ooh. guns and yeah, laying in bed at night. I, I don't want to wake up tomorrow, you know, all that stuff. Writing it all out. And then what happened was my mother used to take me to theater, 18, 19 years old. And she'd see, I'd be, I'd be lit up. She'd say, you should do that. I said, Ma, I can't look at all the people watching the actors. How can I? I can never do that. Are you kidding? She's like, you love it. Look at you. I said, I don't know. I don't know. So the day after my mother died, we used to go support this one guy, Pat Carpenter, who passed away. He, uh, he, he was community theater. I thought he was brilliant. Turns out he, he wasn't brilliant. I just, <laughs> I just loved him. You know, I was so proud of him. Right, you know? right. He was like, oh, my God, he's doing it again. Yeah. He's up there. There's people watch. And I called him the day after my mother died because I was 24. And I said, Pat, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. So next time you hear about it, I called it a tryout. I didn't even know it was called an audition because I was a sports guy. I said, if you hear about a tryout, I'd like to try out for a play. And he goes, there's one coming up. So I go in, I audition. Bill Cecilberg gave me my first yes. He said yes to me. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And so in rehearsal, I would call it play practice because it was like football practice. I'd say, I see you guys at play practice. And they'd go, and I've, no one corrected me. And, they, you know, they were very good to <laughs> yeah. me. But the first time I walked on stage, the first time, I'll never forget it. I was 24. And it was a full house. And it happened. I went, oh, my God. I'm going to do this for the rest of my yeah, life. Yeah. No matter if I got to work some J-O-B. That's what I always tell actors now. It's like, if you end up at some dead-end, eight-hour-a-day job, you could still be an artist. You can't you can't put an amount of money no. on whether you're an artist yeah. or not because yeah. one or two percent get to do this full time. Yeah. yeah. But you could still be an artist. What are you doing with the other eight hours of your day? Right. That's the key, right? Yeah. So I knew at that moment this was gonna be a forever thing. I didn't know how or what. Thank God I've been blessed enough to be able to do this professionally. But it you know, I knew I I fell in love with it. And then I, you know. It took my mom dying for me to have the balls to wow to do it. If she didn't die, I don't know if I would have ever had the courage because at that point I felt like I lost everything and I, I thought, well, and she would have wanted you to, right? Oh yeah. She's been she's been carrying me the whole time. So that's nice. Yeah, like, we've been walking hand in hand the whole time. I know it, you know. You know, death yeah. thinking about death, you know, I I my dad died about 7 I don't know how long ago, 6 months, 7 months now. I'm sorry. Um but I always tell everybody that, because I've had so many people die, man. I mean, I, if you get too close to me, be careful. Good to know. Yeah, so don't get too close to me. Honey, can you call the kids? <laughs> <laughs> I always say that in death, they always leave us a gift. It seems like the gift for you was acting from your mom. Mm. Gift from Donna, who was my makeup artist. Uh, I know Donna. You she know did Donna. my makeup. Yeah, yeah. She's Italian. Yeah, she was the best. She was amazing. See, we were she, like we she, were like brother and sister, man. She was an amazing. Oh, lady. she she was. When she passed, I was really taken back. Yeah, I was really really sad. About but her. you know what she gave me during that death is strength. I didn't even. I mean, I cry. You didn't cry, but after that, I was like, because she would have been like, "Don't cry, don't cry. You better not be strong." I got strength, and then my dad died. He also gave me strength. And my other, one time, uh, my best friend Manny was murdered, stabbed eighteen times. And I remember sitting out. I was going through a rough time, and I was sitting at, at my property. And I look up, and there's three hawks flying together, man. And you don't see three hawks flying like that. And I said, "All right, Manny. Thank you." So the beautiful part about you is that your mom, now you, you know, that's a, that's a beautiful thing she left you. Yeah. That's, and that's just a gift. You don't, yeah. you know, you feel it, right? Oh, no doubt. We were very close. The other thing my mother gave me, I, as a kid, I went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy. I did all this stuff. I got thrown out of like three grammar schools. I was out of my mind. But I had no spiritual life and no belief in God at all and it wasn't until my mother passed i did the opposite of what i hear everyone else say everyone else says f you god i don't believe it the opposite happened to me i went 
oh my God, I got somebody now. Wow. I had a I had a connection to a higher power. I'll just call it that. Because, you know, it's it's semantics, whatever you want to yeah. call it. it. It wasn't until I had a personal relationship. I like to say now, it's like people say, do you believe in God? I say, God to me is my best self. Mm -hmm. It's my... It's my highest self. It's not me, of course. It's in other words, when I'm walking in God's grace, what I say is I'm walking hand in hand with my very best self, my best choices, not my yeah. not my demons. And, it, and my mother gave me that gift too because I had no spiritual connection to anything. It was all just like, yeah, whatever, you know. It's not true, you know. God was like Santa Claus to me. Yes, 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 yes. And, you know, Lenny Bruce had a great quote, which I know I'm sure we'll get to. Lenny, oh, I love it. Lenny said, Lenny said, uh, every day people are leaving the church and finding God. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a, exactly. That's so, a good one. I like but that. I identify with that. And it wasn't until my mother went to the other side that I went, wow, okay. So, you, you know, it's see. funny that we're getting into religion here. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit here. Uh, I didn't know it was going to go here. It's no, like I said, we're just going to go where we go. Uh, I was brought up Catholic. Okay. Then I, you know, lost my mind at 22 in a mental institution and, and then went through eight months of depression. Mm -hmm. And I used to curse God every morning, man. Why the fuck are you doing this to me? This is the most painful thing in the world. I used to roll out of bed. I used to, it was horrible. Like I said, I said before, the only great moments was when I was sleeping and I could dream that I was happy. I mean, it was like horrible. So then after I had a second breakdown a year later and it was all about God and the devil, right? And I went to this church and I was dressed bad, you know, kind of like a, like a bum. I'm not a bum, you know what I mean? I'm a bum. Is that your brand though? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a bum. Anyway. And this father comes out, this priest, he says, you can't go in there. I said, why? And Paula was right there. And he says, because you're dressed like that. I said, I'm, I'm in a bad way. And I just, he goes, you can't go in. So after that. That is so upsetting to me because you're, you're exactly the person who needs to go in there. Exactly. You're exactly, exactly who they need to invite in. See, that's the problem. So I said, all right, I'm going to become Christian. But, you know, it's tough because you don't, I haven't followed it. But I truly believe in God because every time I go through uh, suffering or, or torment, from anxiety or uh, bipolar or whatever, depression, I always say, this you, life is too hard to do it alone. You got to have a higher power, bro. Whether it be a Buddha, God, a, uh, you know, my, whatever it is that that helps you, because it's too difficult at times. You know, you know, it's the thing. The thing about religion is, I don't think religion and God are synonymous. I think that's dangerous because, personally, I think that. I think religion is awesome, and I think every religion is valuable. I don't think Buddha is better than Christianity. No, no, right, right. I think it's all valuable. I think it's all necessary. In other words, it gives people a place to belong, a structure. Yes. I think all of that is valuable. Yes. But I think that my God is not better than your God. Right. Or anything like that. Right. Whatever works for you that gives you peace, helps you. You know, about four years ago, I had a situation in my life where I was, uh, I was at my darkest place, and... I had no conscious contact with a higher power. It was, I was just white knuckling it through. I was very unhappy, feeling lost. And I did what you're talking about. It got to a point where I literally said, I have a sponsor, I'm sober. I, you know, I talk about that freely. But my sponsor gave me some direction. He said, I want you to bring God everywhere you go. He goes, let's use the word God because it's easy. Said, okay. I, everywhere you go, God, I'm going to go wash your dishes. You want to come? God, you want to go? God, listen, I'm going to go to the bathroom. God, will you join me? God, I'm hungry. You hungry? Let's have something to eat. God. And he said, I want you to do that every day, all day. And I did. And it was embarrassing at first. Because sometimes I wasn't alone in the house. Yeah, yeah. But what happened as a result is 
I didn't feel alone. Mm. Like you're talking about. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I built this friendship, this com conscious contact with a higher power mm -hmm. with, that I could rely on rather than outside shenanigans. Right. Whether right. it be gambling or food yeah, yeah. or money or about drug, whatever. And it's really crazy how once I committed to it in a real way and had no expectation of it, it worked for me. So when people ask me, do I believe in God? I do. It's a personal I get, choice. We're the same way. It's a personal choice. I don't, you're never going to hear me on the street corner going, God. No, we're the same it's way. It's not about that. Yeah. It's about I have a relationship with something that has, has helped me through the darkest And times, also, you know? if you think about this, and not because she's here, but isn't your fiancé and my wife or anybody's fiancé, girlfriend or wife, a higher power? In a sense. Well, she thinks she is. I'm just uh, <laughs> See, he had to go to a joke. He had to go to a joke. But, but a little it, uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but isn't it but isn't it isn't that? I mean, because I, I feel same with my mother when I was young, when I first had that's that almost there's a higher, higher power, but there's also a higher power, which is anybody you can go to who can get you out of there at least temporarily, man. Yeah, ulti yes, ultimately. Or even a friend, anybody. You know, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, but ultimately, most people, and I mean this with love, most people are walking around with their head in the clouds. Yeah. And they're thinking about me, me, me. I got to get more yeah. for me. And I'm sure we've been guilty of it in our moments in our life. Yes. Of course, I know we have, yeah. right? But it is really nice to have a Paula, or in my case, a Janelle, where you have a best friend who takes you with all your shortcomings. And, yes. And is signed up for it and understands that uh with every hard conversation with every good conversation with every difficult moment yeah. just cements the thing it's i i hope and pray people get to have a person or two really authentically yeah in their life like that because it's rare mo because it Paul yes, is rare i understand i understand i mean to have someone to sit sit with yeah, you through it all 35 years right yeah but you know i think the more the merrier and if you can have uh god and your wife at least you got two there right yeah yeah and if you got your some your your son your 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 daughter whoever else friend yeah. the more the merrier because it's really difficult as you know when you're in those dark yeah. times to do it alone i can't I, i'll be totally honest with you if i had to do what i've been through in my life you wouldn't be here anymore i wouldn't i know i wouldn't i know i hear you loud and believe me me too i uh Mo, it got so bad. Uh, that's why it's funny. You know, it's interesting. It's like we talk about state of mind and bipolar. And, you know, I've never been tested for anything officially, but, you know, as an addict and an alcoholic, somebody who's been sober. But I'm going to say this right now. Yeah. You are you are the best in the best state of mind that I've seen. I, I know I haven't seen you in a long time, but you here now compared to what I knew. Yeah. You've grown just enormously thanks bro and i don't know if it's janelle or just yourself i did so much work that i was able to attract janelle you understand janelle, oh, oh, janelle wow, that's good I janelle like that. didn't come in in the dark time she came she came in when i was ready wow because i wasn't that's and profound was, brother and i know it very clearly i mean it wasn't long ago i was you know in my car till three four in the morning waiting till everybody went to sleep go in sleep get up before everybody else and leave it was just dark you know it was just you don't want anybody to see you yeah yeah because i because i was i was i was struggling with so many things and i and i didn't know where to start and you know i don't know if you could identify with this you probably can and you're probably better at it than me but people have always had an expectation of me yeah whether it be like and everyone has that with everybody yeah but specifically with me like i was always like the leader of the theater group i'm the guy you know you said some funny things to me when i was at gh but like i'm always making movies i'm yeah. always pulling people together yeah i'm always doing the thing let's let ronnie be in charge he'll get yeah. it done and so it got to a point where so many people depended on me at all times that i needed to just be alone with with all the other stuff because i don't want to let anybody down i don't want to ever say to anybody i can't do that today mm. i'm not feeling well you know what i mean and so uh, how are you in because this is was my problem for a long time i think i'm finally over it i hope how are you about caring what people think about you 
I take it really hard. Oh. I'm not over it. But I've been working on it. Me too. Specifically. That shit that it. shit will bring you downtown, bro. I'm not over it. I um you know the problem is is God gave people free will. And sometimes with free will you make bad decisions and then you let people down. And that's always been the hardest thing for me, thinking I disappointed you because I take that really hard. Mm. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Uh, right. If I walk into a room of 100 people, I know who the one person is who has a problem with me. I see it. I see it too, yeah. I don't see the other 99 going, yeah. oh, you're great, we love you. I see, what's the matter with him? He doesn't like me. What you I know, mean? they used to say that Martin Brando, who's, that's, you know that's Martin Brando. Uh, I, I thought you pointed to yourself. No. Like, oh, whoa, 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 I gotta go. <laughs> no, 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 that, that statue. I thought you pointed to his. That's, 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 that's Marlon that's Brando. Oh my God. New York Times bestseller. No, I know you look. Oh, sorry. Uh, you take a little, <laughs> little drop there. Uh, he'd go into a party and he'd leave if because one person didn't like him. I'm not surprised. But that, but that, you got to get over that. Yeah, you do. But that's not ask, a good, I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing. But let me ask you this, Mo. Yeah. With that vulnerability and all that stuff that comes with it, that's, let, let me reverse it. People are walking around their whole life. They don't have recovery. They don't have a, I had so much and still have, I feel so deeply and so profoundly and as high as I go is as low as I go in a minute. Okay. And I know you understand yeah, that. Yeah. Which, but what makes us bless guys is that we have a place to put it in our art okay and i get and and i get nervous that if i ever get too recovered mm -hmm. i i don't know if i'll be the same actor you always be the same actor let me tell you something i know i hate that i know what you're saying and many people i hate to go back to kanye west but there's a lot of people who are bipolar who don't take medication because they're artists and they're gonna they no, I know that's a problem. Right, I, right. I, I don't mean that. I, I know what you're saying, but I tell my class. Well, I teach a class. I don't know if you know right. this. I teach a class every Wednesday on Zoom. Did you teach a class at interrupting people? It's called stop fucking acting. Yeah, I do. <laughs> this fucking guy. Uh, I said, I, you know, no. The artist thing is this. They don't take. So they think that okay. I've been I've been on lithium for thirty years. Wow. And it, I don't have to tell you what I've done in my career because it's... Uh, no, you've showed me your resume 50 <laughs> times. But I've been on medication and the beauty is I haven't had a breakdown in 30 years. No, you're right. But when I went off early on, when I went off lithium, I had two more breakdowns because mm. I went off it. So it's now, working for you. Obviously. And it didn't hasn't affected my creativity. It's just made me... A, a, a normal human being somewhat so but i get what you're saying but i when i rudely interrupted you two <laughs> minutes ago let me clear this up I, I i did that because you know i had i had you know it's funny look at this <laughs> look at this guy oh I my miss god you, you son of a bitch just listen to me okay go ahead you know remember, remember that two minutes ago I think what happened was I just had a reaction because I don't really mean that. What I really, because what I tell my, I, I teach every week Wednesdays, okay. right? I teach a class called Stop Fucking Acting. I love it. That's the name of the class. I on love Wednesdays, it. I yeah. teach it on yeah. Zoom. It's great. Yeah. I tell them all the time if you guys are actively working on yourself, if you're in therapy, if you're writing, if you're doing the work, you will be a better actor. Uh, if absolutely. you're opening yourself up, if you're available, yeah. yes. you'll be available. So I agree with what you're yes. saying. I think what I meant was, is I always had that fear that maybe medication would squash that. But I understand it's not true. And in fact, in fact, I lived with somebody for a long time who was on uh, antidepressants. And I, I, and I didn't dismiss it, but I was always, I had that little thought in the back of my head because I didn't know anybody else who took them. I always had that, that stigma like, do you really, do you really, yeah, do yeah. you really? And then they they said, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how much I need." They went off for a couple of days. Oh my god! I was like, "Oh no, yeah." I, you know, they didn't do it for me. I'm just saying they tried yeah. it on the road, and I went, "I see clearly now." So, so I'm hip to what you're saying. I think uh, you need that help, and it doesn't touch the creativity. So, in no, fact, it, doesn't it enhances touch maybe. The, it, it, well, I don't know about enhances, you, you know. But the problem is when when I had my third breakdown when i threatened to kill my wife um 
I was started working at General Hospital. And I'd be in scenes and all this stuff was happening, man. Sonny's crying for no, was not supposed to be crying. Three weeks into the gig, I'm a bad guy. And I'm like, Ugh. and that's I, why you're so likable. You said that's, <laughs> that's why they loved you because you always had this like this other, ability. Yes, but it was little like. So then, I saw right after my breakdown, I quit the show three weeks into the show. It's a, it's in my. Oh, I got to read the book. I'll yeah. get it. All right, I'll get it. So, I uh, now I forgot what I was gonna say. So three weeks into the gig, I quit, and I saw tapes of. Me, because I, as a as a mentally ill person, you don't see yourself. Mm. You see it, you see it, everybody sees it, but you don't. So I, Paul and I were on the bed. I said, let's watch. And we watched. It was bad, you ugly. It, really? The acting was evil, which was perfect for the role, but my eyes were black. Mm. That's not good. I understand. You know, it's like, ugh. So I tell people, uh, as far as like anxiety and whatnot, if the anxiety is not that bad, you can get through it with meditation and yoga and all this other stuff, breathing. But if it gets bad, like it was for me during the pandemic, you better get on something. Mm -hmm. Otherwise. No, I've seen it. I, I know. And, and, it's, and one thing I admire about you is that you always put all of you into what you do. Yes. Wherever you are, you don't shy away. You don't try to ignore it. You don't try to avoid it. No. It's, it's uh, part yeah. of it. And I admire that. Yeah, thank lot. you. You're welcome. All right, we've done enough mental health talk, and now we're going to get into some maybe a little bit of fun stuff. Can we do that? Uh, yeah, okay. I guess you know, because, if we have to. Like, well, this is, I mean, I was, I was thinking, what's Ronnie going to... We're probably just going to talk about Lenny Bruce for an hour. You didn't know that I actually had substance because you don't pay attention. To no, me. I'll be honest with you. In the hallway, General Hospital, you go, hey, Ryan, hey, Don. Hey, Don. Hey, Mom, right here. That's not exactly how it went, but I, no, broke, I, knew, I broke your balls a lot of GA. I knew that we would get into some yeah. stuff, but I didn't know it was going to be, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know it was going to be this, I have to say it again, profound, and I love it. Good. So I too. appreciate it. You got it, Tom. Uh, so tell me about getting GH. How was that all about? It was really interesting because, as I said, Vanessa and you – it seemed that it seemed kind of out of reach because I was like doing this community theater play and I wanted and Tyler Christopher and Vanessa were together early on. Tyler and I became instant friends. So I'm working at the macaroni grill. He's winning Emmys on GH and he's flying on the weekends to Edison, New Jersey, so we could play golf. And I'm like, Oh my God. You know, so is this is really interesting thing. So I always had this weird connection with General Hospital, like all my friends were on it. Maybe someday I'll get a, a professional job. And then when I came out to L.A., I lived with Vanessa for a year as a friend, friend, she, sister, really. Ooh. I lived. In, no, nothing weird happened. All right. She, she was. It was family. Truly, truly family. In fact, she told everybody I was her brother and she would introduce me as such. So uh, she got me my SAG card on 90210. Now, at that time, did you sense that Tyler had a problem with drinking? The day I got there. She and Tyler split up the day I arrived in L.A., and I took care of him, oh, boy. meaning like I was always with him. We were best of friends. I ended up staying with him at one point in this little studio apartment, just me and him and Dirk Cheatwood. Dirk's great. Dirk got this, mo at the time, he got that U571 movie. I'll never forget it. And he left for Italy for a couple of months. And so there was three of us in a studio apartment for like a month or two. Um but Tyler and I got really close really quick. I, I always identified with him. I thought he was great. I always was worried about Ty. I knew that, and I was already sober. See, that's the thing. I was. So, I, I haven't had a legal drink. I got sober 20 years old. Wow. I've never, I've never had a legal drink. That's phenomenal. I've been, I haven't had a drink, drug, or a cigarette in 31 years. And so it changed my life, thank God. That's why I look 25 years old, Mo. You know I can't I mean? believe your skin is yeah, amazing. Yeah, well, you want to touch it later? Not After really. we're done, I'll let you rub it if you no. want. Uh, anyway, uh, so... So you kind of knew that, obviously... I was always worried about him. In fact, he would get, you know, he would be in trouble and go to rehab and this and that. And I would always be up at family uh, day at the rehab. And he's my best friend. Like, I, lo I love him. Um, always worried. 
And so I would take them to meetings and this and that. And I was always a really active participant in sobriety. I still am. And uh, in fact, more now than maybe ever. And um, we became close. So I end up in LA and uh, I got my SAG card on 90210 from Vanessa. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And so I started to do little bit parts and getting a couple opportunities. So then one day... Gwen from the casting office yeah, calls me and goes, hey, Ronnie, I know it's because they knew me. I'd go up, have lunch with Tyler and I'd see you around and you barely acknowledge me. Thank you. I was a big star. Oh, I understand. I understand how I big a star you are. I can't acknowledge people. Yeah, are... but you got to remember on your way up. Yeah, uh, I know. You know. Because on your now, you know, you know what I mean? So, uh, so anyway, <laughs> I'm really just, <laughs> I'd see you at the commissary go, oh, what was what's that eggplant over there? What did they got? Sandwiches? Anyway, so... <laughs> I love that he laughs. Nothing comes out. It's the best. I love it. So anyway, <laughs> Gwen says, hey, there's this little part, this little silly part as Jax's limo driver. Why oh. don't you come do it? It's an under five. I was so happy. Under five. I'll do it. Uh, we won't tell Tyler. He's in the scene. He'll just be sitting on set. He's That's like, oh, good. So they did it. I do it. I was a must join the union at that time because I had done a young and yeah. restless that it cost me 1200 to do the friggin' roll. Right, actually, right. you understand? But I did it. And then one day I'm doing a play. Crystal Craft directed me and Danny in the Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So okay. I, I'm doing the play. Bob Guza shows up. Oh, I love Bob. I don't know Bob Guza. Such love a writer, man. Seriously, he's just that's my dark. Guy. That's my guy. I love dark writers. So Bob, Bob Guza shows up. I don't know him. There's four people in the audience that night. Tyler's one of them. Crystal, Bob Guza. Afterwards, he goes, hey, nice to meet you, buddy. He says, you're a good actor. I said, thank you. He said, you ever think of doing a soap opera? I go, not really. I don't. I never really saw myself in that world. But he said, uh, all right, nice to meet you. Calls me the next day. He goes, this is Bob Guza. Yeah, he goes, come down to General. Come down to ABC. I want to talk to you. I go down to Prospect Studios. Guza calls me in his office. He goes, listen to me. I've been thinking about this storyline for a long time. You're five years too old to play Dante. You probably don't even know this. Oh. He goes, but you remind me of Mo. I told oh. you, we've been saying this my whole life. He goes, if you were five years younger, you would play Dante. But I have an idea. He says, but he goes, you know who Serpico is? Oh, I love Serpico. I go, I love Serpico. I said that. He goes, I've been wanting to write this part, but I didn't have the right actor. I think I have the right actor now. I want you to do it. I'm going to write the part. That's who Ronnie Domestico was, was based on, was Serpico. I thought it was Domestico. Domestico, Domestico. <laughs> Say it however you want. So I go, okay, he goes, give me a month. I go, yeah, give you a month. There's him and everybody else in showbiz. Give me a month. I'm going to be out of showbiz. A month later, they call me up. Wow. Hey, you start work Monday. What's my character name? Ronnie. I go, oh, Guza stayed up all night thinking of that yeah, one. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it was amazing. And he goes, he wrote this role. And I go, how many episodes, Bob? He goes, I don't know, like five. I did 150 which was a huge blessing. Wow. I was on for three years. Three years? It was the most humble. I felt it was a too long. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. uh, look at the time. I got to get out. I felt three years. It was the most humbling, hardest job I've ever had. Yeah. I never felt, and this is me being really honest, I never felt until the last... I know a lot of times on a soap opera, you go up the stairs, you don't come back down the stairs, your character's yeah. over. I am very grateful that Frank Valentini gave me like 11 episode arc at the end where I kidnapped everybody. I, I went dark. But before that, I had a really hard time. If you went back and watched the scenes with me now, I could totally point out to you like, oh, I was holding on by a thread there, schmacking there. Okay, really? That, uh, you yeah, didn't seem to me like you were. Well, I appreciate that. But, wow. but I never was comfortable because... I would work for two days and then won't come in for two weeks. And I uh, never got in the rhythm of the one take, the quick, the... But, and it was probably very difficult when you worked with me. And well, the, you know, the intensity. I had to carry those scenes. I That's know. what I'm my, saying. My back was killing me. And so I, lo I love the job. I, I'll, I'll never, it made me a better actor. Certainly when I left GH and started doing indies, I was one take Ronnie on I all know. these indies because I'm like, you need another take because I'm yeah. good because that's why you get up there. What you said when you introduced me, I appreciated because I think at the end, a lot of people didn't know that I was, was an actor. Yeah. You know, there's a difference. There's people doing the job and then there's actors who like live and love their craft. And I think when they saw me get to do the stuff, the last 10 episodes, 11 yeah, episodes, yeah. they were like, oh. Damn, oh. you had that many at the end? 
Yeah, it was really great. I took everybody hostage. It was great. Brother, people come in and go. After I know. Three it was all respect. I felt a lot of respect. Now, I yeah. saw you do a, a, some scenes with James Franco. Now, I know James Franco was just coming in like this is soap, and I'll just kind of be flippant. But you really did kick his ass in those scenes that I watched. Thank you. I don't know if I saw them all, but at least I saw two or three. And I know he wasn't, he was just like, eh, soap opera. But you were really good in the scenes. Thanks, pal. And I was kind of rooting for you. I appreciate that. I took well, you those... played it very uh, on point to the serious. Thank you. And you weren't going to play around. I did scenes with him also, and I kind of, I was probably way too serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you played. You're like right. you're gonna come into. Our yeah, world. yeah, but yeah. I, you know, well, the, the fans didn't like him coming in. They're like, yeah. we don't want you. But this is our thing. Yeah, uh, General Hospital fans are the best. Oh, they're the world. best because you, you know they still support me. They come to all my plays. They're the they most to show. loyal fans in the it world. Is, that is literally not just a nice thing to say. It's the truth. It's the truth. Yeah, they're great, and they still support everything I do. Um, and I remember when Franco came in, they were like, "Listen, movie star, move along. This is our world." Right. It's great, and I loved having him there because I thought it just brought a little more. Yeah, no, to no, the show. yeah. He's and a big. There, there was yeah, there was energy to the show. And he's done okay. great roles and movies oh, and he's a good actor he's you know? a damn good actor and so let's let's conclude this with uh lenny bruce what you wrote this mm -hmm. you directed it joe montagna oh joe montagna joe's my director so what how'd that happen so about 17 18 years ago this guy charlie brill he's a great comic friend of mine he came to me and he goes hey uh you know who Lenny Bruce was? And I said, well, kind of. He was before my time. I know George Carlin. I know Richard, Richard Pryor. Pryor. I know those guys. Yeah. He goes, well, but I said, I know of Lenny. He said, you remind me of him. I said, oh, yeah. He said, some guy wrote me a play. Why don't you, it's a one-man show. Why don't you do it? I'll direct it. I said, I don't know. Two years it took to talk me into it. I did it. We ran for six months. Guza directed it. You saw it. I saw it, yeah. Okay, but that was, so he, here's me being, Here's the truth. It was a good show. I fell in love with Lenny through the process. I realized how much we identified with each other, but I felt like something was missing. It was like, not disrespectful of Lenny, but we were leaving a lot of the story out. Right. We weren't doing his bits. We weren't doing anything. It wasn't gritty. It was like a cute version of Lenny Bruce. So I said to the writer, hey, let's put in his routines. Let's do the stuff. And he said, nah, my play's written. So I took five years and I wrote my own. Wow. I got the rights to all his material. And I fell in love with Lenny. And as an actor, and I know you'll appreciate that because I think you have this with Sonny, is if you get one of these in your life yeah. where you go, he did this, he was good in that, he did this in, in the obituary. Maurice was did this, he played this, he did that. And he played Sonny. I'm yeah, sure yeah. This is, and he played Lenny Bruce. Yeah, wow. This is that for me. I fell in love with him. The love he has for his mom, the love he has for his daughter, his addiction, uh, so many parallels that play was safe my play i start the play dead naked on the toilet no and it doesn't let up for 90 minutes and i just did my 392nd performance of this one man show 392 i just got called last week i'm doing bellingham washington i'm doing milwaukee i'm doing uh where else are we going uh, I don't know where I'm going. Uh, San Francisco. Uh, Are you serious? Yeah, so we're starting to do a national tour of this show. It's become this phenomenon. It's become people want to see it. It's I'm very proud of it. I wrote it. Uh, I'm starring in it. Joe is still as involved as ever. And I'm so proud to tell his story. Fox You've been doing it for how many years? Well, if you count the old play, 17. But if you count my play, we opened five years ago, I think next month, in L.A., I ran 150 performances here, 135 in Chicago, My 100 God. in New York off Broadway. I did uh, West Palm last week, last month. I'm doing Tampa the end of May, uh, and then now I'm starting to tour the, the country. So you're naked in the beginning. Dead of, naked on stage. Now are you really naked, or you have a little thing oh. covering? Listen, I, I wish you wouldn't call it a little thing, Maurice. <laughs> I know it's been a while since you've seen it, but you know. Little thing. See, see where he goes right away. Well, they, aren't you like him? How that's that must be amazing. That tough or what? Artist to artist, I'll I'll tell you this. How do you do? You get up from the toilet. Get up and, put and my people other see your penis. 
Listen, you're making me a cut. No, no. Why do you have to be so penis? Well, I gotta be. You know, no, you're very, very grown up right. the way you talk. Penis. So people, here's what happens. I say a couple lines. I get up in front of everybody. I put my underwear on. I turn to the audience and I start and I dress. Oh, but you don't turn to the audience. Well, they before. see it. It depends where you're sitting. Apparently, if you sit house right, the mystery's over. In fact, I met Janelle. <laughs> Here he goes. Here he goes. I love that. I met Janelle, my fiance. She was in Chicago on business. And she, she bought one ticket left. It was sold at house. And she sat front row all the way house right. And we had, we've talked every day since. And that was uh, November. So, of, I guess she, so she saw the thing. Well, right, yeah. I can live with that. She can That'll do the it. trick. You know? Wow. And, and artist to artist, here's what I'm going to tell you. When I start to play dead naked on the toilet, it's as vulnerable as I'm going to be. I've never seen anything. And, yeah. and what, I, what I'm saying to the audience, I hope they're getting from that is, I'm here. This is all I have. This is me. At my, this is what I have. Come on this ride with me, and that's what I do. And by the way, I start. The, I end the play the same way. It's I bookend it. I start the play exactly where Lenny's life was found, and I tell it in reverse, and uh, and that's just a taste. The play is very. Did you see Dustin Hoffman in the movie? Yeah, I saw. It. How How did you think? I think he's one of our greatest actors. I do too. I think he's. The, I don't think he's Lenny Bruce. I think yeah, he's the wrong guy. They should have got a, a young Pacino, somebody with you're gravitas, probably right, somebody yeah. who, because because Lenny was, he was like he was the kind of guy that like, you would ask him to do a favor for him. Hey Lenny, can I paint your house? You know. Yeah. So charming and so yeah. he had a sex appeal, and Joan Rivers said he was the sexiest guy she ever saw or met. Wow. So Lenny had a thing, and I don't think that was Hoffman's thing. I think a young Pacino, maybe, who had the yeah, yeah, a young Pacino, yeah. But but I'm I'm grateful, Mo. I, th this role won't define my career, but it's certainly been it's brought a lot of blessings to me. First of all, my fiance, but but also it's brought uh, lots of other work. I've been working nonstop, thank God, uh, in films and TV, and so I've been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, and you know, I. You know, I have a little bit of a daydream to get to go back and do some stuff on GH at some point. Yeah. That was a while ago, and I feel like I've progressed, and uh, I don't know. You yeah, know. but you seem like you're in good, in a great place. I'm in a great place. So that's what matters. I'm happy. I'm yeah. happy. And your hair, I don't know how you keep... You like this hair, right? Well... When you look at me, sometimes I see you just looking at my hair, and it's like I uncomfortable. I just feel you know? like it's a lot of hair, like... If you, listen, when we're done, I'll let you touch it. You it's rub, amazing. You could rub my face. You could touch the hair. I'll let you do it. Your whatever. skin and you got all that hair. It's like you don't age. Nice, right? I'm That's, very lucky. And you're supposed to say the same about me. But oh, no, you look. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But my hair is kind of not like yours, but my skin is really nice. Listen, and I got dimples age. and stuff. You, you, look. Yeah, that's can cool. I say something about can I give you another compliment? I know you hate this. No, I think you should give me more. But go ahead. What the true genius of working on a soap opera and you specifically is, and I mean this with love and it's not disrespect. Bob Guza told me and taught me that soap operas are written for the casual fan. Meaning you'll tell a story over a period of time and you'll probably notice you'll do the same three scenes for six months. Yeah. They're just worded a little different. Right. And your true genius, Mo, is that you're able to keep those fresh and unique every scene. Because if you go back and watch those scenes, you're really telling the same story. Like you're true. saying the same thing over and over. Yeah. I always say, people said, how was GH? I said, I did 150 episodes in about six different scenes. Because my, <laughs> my line was, you've gotten closer to the Cantos yeah. family than you've ever... you got to figure out a way to do it a, just a tad differently. A million percent. And that's hard. That makes That's really, I always say, and I don't know if people understand or know that, but GH is actually written, or soap operas, are written for the person who tunes in once a week or once every yeah. two weeks. Now, you have tons of fans who tune in every day, but if but if you if you tune in once every couple of weeks, you're still in the story. It's a good way of, a good way of putting it. And you are, I always brag about you yeah. saying, how does this guy take... The same three scenes and they're so fresh and it feels like a new storyline. So I really admire that. Well, that's that's okay. Let's conclude this, Ronnie. Because oh, I, on a high note, right? Yeah, on me because it's <laughs> the way it should be. It's my show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you know one time we had lunch? And I can't. I'm gonna leave it there. All right. Uh, I just want to say uh, about Ronnie Marmo. Very underrated actor. That's the first thing that comes to my head is that. Um, but this conversation was to me engaging just 
things that he was saying was so smart and the way he's saying it with so much energy and so calm and with a lot of love. It's so important. Um, and I'm glad that uh, I got to talk to you. I didn't know. I knew it was going to be really good. I didn't know it was going to be so easy. You know, sometimes you don't know. You get yeah. in here, oh, Ronnie's changed. <laughs> well, thanks, pal. But we, you and I never get to sit. It's always, we're always two ships in the night. I know, To I know. sit and just really talk. And, you know, I have, I always feel like I never want to be too anonymous with my sobriety that I can't help somebody. That's, okay, good. And so you. that's, it was important for me to say that out loud because I know there's probably teenagers who don't think they can get clean and sober yet because they're too young. That's true. And they're not. And the, the key not. is to what you just said and it's what, what, State of mind is all about. It's been like that from the beginning. I'll say it again. One person wrote me. I was in dark times and said, because I was thinking of not doing this anymore. And she just said one thing, and I said, I can't stop. She said, uh, by watching you and your guests speak, I feel like I'm not alone. Mm. And I said, wow, okay. That's why I can't stop can't stop because if it's not about you no right this is a high yes, calling this exactly is... all right brother thank you mo i love you and do me a favor mo <laughs> lose my phone number all right please